the, uh, the introduction and, and thank you very much to CMEX for the um, invitation to come and speak here. It's really a pleasure to come and speak with a, in front of a group of farmers. Um, probably something a little bit different that you're going to hear from me and certainly a very different group to be speaking to. I, I'm normally talking to athletes or nutritionists or most of my day job as, as a lecturer to students. So it's uh, hopefully some interesting questions at the end and um, some perhaps left field questions which will be good for me as well. Um, so my brief was to talk really about milk as a post-exercise recovery drink. Um, and I've come up with this title, uh, Milk, doesn't seem to work on the board, um, Milk, Nature's Sports Drink. Um, and trying to kind of pose the question as to whether milk might be an adequate replacement for some of the drinks that we see some of our athletes and sports people consuming in, in quite large quantities. If we think about nutrition in relation to sport and exercise, there are really three places where nutrition can interact with, with exercise. That's before exercise, as we would call it pre-exercise nutrition, um, during exercise, and after exercise. And I'm not going to say that milk is the ideal uh, sports drink or, or drink to consume in all of those settings, but certainly post-exercise, I think there are a number of arguments that that make milk really a beneficial drink to be consuming after exercise. And I'm going to try and take you through those, those scenarios here. So we're going to talk principally about post-exercise nutrition. Perhaps this might be the, the typical scene that you might expect to see. A, a group of guys that have finished a, a training session in this, in this case, all drinking their uh, nicely coloured uh, recovery drinks there. Um, I'm trying to perhaps justify the use of milk in this sort of setting rather than, than some of those, those drinks that are commercially sold. So really there are three main goals of post-exercise nutrition. The first one is uh, resynthesis of muscle glycogen. So when we exercise, we have two main fuels that our body uses to perform that exercise. Those two main fuels are either the fat that's contained in our body, or the, the glycogen. Glycogen is uh, our body's store of glucose or carbohydrate. And if we do particularly high intensity exercise, so the sort of thing you might see footballers or rugby players or hockey players doing, we use quite large amounts of muscle glycogen. So therefore, if we're looking to optimize recovery after exercise, we need to consider replacement of that muscle glycogen. The second component of recovery is, is protein synthesis. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but, but we believe that perhaps the, the protein synthetic response after exercise might actually facilitate the recovery that takes place. And this is probably where milk has its, its most important effect, is on, on stimulating muscle protein synthesis. And I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about that in a minute. And then the third component is, is rehydration. So this is replacement of water losses after exercise. When we exercise, our metabolic rate increases. That creates a lot of um, extra heat that the body produces, and we need to try and regulate our body temperature. And the primary way that we do that during exercise is through producing sweat. That means that we lose quite large amounts of water in some cases, and therefore, we need to rehydrate after exercise to make sure that that dehydration doesn't continue to, to be present. Um, now, I'm going to talk about these three specific areas and, and kind of talk about milk's use and milk's application in actually meeting some of these demands that our, our exercising athletes actually need. So, there are probably three main areas that post-exercise nutrition is important. So I've talked you through the main strategies that we're looking for with our post-exercise nutrition, but there are also three different environments. The, so the first on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got resistance exercise. And this is the type of exercise that you would see bodybuilders doing, but also that perhaps many of you do in the gym. So if you're using those guided weights machines, or you're lifting dumbbells or barbells, or you're going to circuit classes and you're doing press-ups and squats and squat thrusts and all of those sort of things, that's resistance type exercise. And when we're looking at optimizing recovery from resistance exercise, the main things that we're looking at are muscle protein synthesis and trying to induce an enhanced muscle protein synthesis and perhaps a little bit of glycogen resynthesis. 
Um, if, we're, if we're looking at endurance exercise, and we've got a picture of Bradley Wiggins there, um, so the sort of exercise that anybody who cycles or runs or you know, does rowing or swimming or, or any of those sort of exercises, that's endurance type exercise. And in that setting, the main, the main recovery strategies that we're looking at is resynthesis of muscle glycogen and also rehydration. Protein synthesis plays a less, lesser important role there. And then the, the third um, setting that we're looking at is, is really in weight management. And this, I guess, is a, an ever-evolving field of nutrition. With our ever-increasing levels of obesity, um, we're constantly looking for new strategies to try and optimize energy balance and reduce the, the weight gain that's occurring and try and reduce levels of obesity and overweight in our population. Um, you might perhaps make the argument that here, no post-exercise nutrition is important because if we give somebody something to eat after exercise and they're looking for weight management, that might just be extra energy and extra calories that that person is actually consuming that might negatively affect the energy balance um, uh, effects of, of exercise. But I'll, I'll talk you through those three separate areas. And this is really going to be the, the focus of my presentation in, in, in that order. <clears throat> so, first of all, to talk about the composition of milk. Now, I'm fairly confident that most of you are going to be pretty, uh, pretty okay with the composition of milk, um, but I've just, as a comparison, put up next to that a, a typical sports drink. So this is one of your, your typical isotonic sports drinks that you see sold on the shelves. And if you look at composition there, I guess the main differences are the, the protein content. And I've used skimmed milk here because that's what most of the research is focused on. I haven't picked skimmed milk because I'm anti um, full fat milk or standardized high fat milk. It's because uh, that's what most of the research has been done on. And the main difference between those two is really the protein content of the milk. And, and as we'll see as the presentation progresses, that's a, a, an important component of a lot of the research that's actually been done. Um, I guess at this stage, I'd, I'd quite like to say um, I'm, I'm a keen milk drinker. I probably drink about a pint of milk a day as a minimum, I would say. Um, and hearing some of the talks that we've had this morning and, and this afternoon as well, uh, it's really been quite interesting for me to, to see what, what's going on in the dairy industry and the problems that you're having. And as a consumer, I would happily pay more for my milk. I'd happily pay quite a bit more. Um, and I think it's, it's fairly disgraceful that, for example, uh, I can buy four pints of skimmed milk for about a pound in the supermarket, and for that same price, I wouldn't even get one bottle of sports drink, 500 mils. So really, the, the bang for buck in milk versus sports drink from an economic point of view to the athlete and to the sports person is, is as you'll see, probably unarguable, I think. So, first of all, resistance exercise. Now, this is where I perhaps talk a little bit more science and maybe have to take a little bit more time. Here, what I've got is two graphs here. On the, um, on the top, I have feeding um, stimulated changes in muscle protein synthesis. And you can see here that the, the dotted line is muscle protein synthesis. So this is the synthesis of new muscle proteins within the body. And the green line is muscle protein breakdown. And you can see that that's a, a, almost a sinusoidal wave there. So it changes over the course of the day. When we eat something that contains protein, that increases our rates of muscle protein synthesis. With time, that decreases. And that process continues over the course of the day in response to different feeding times. So perhaps breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's there. However... That protein synthesis, as you can see, is pretty transient and it's offset by the decrease in protein synthesis that occurs in the periods of fasting. So if we're looking at increasing somebody's muscle mass and then gaining muscle mass, feeding alone and just eating protein-containing foods isn't going to be sufficient. Um, an interesting fact, really, if we look at the rates of, of muscle protein synthesis and protein turnover in the body, is that those rates are about 1% per day. 
So about 1% of our skeletal muscle, so the muscle that is on our legs and arms and, and similar muscles, um, turns over per day. So if you take your leg and you look at it on one day and you look at it in about six months' time, it will be a completely new set of proteins. So that leg has been completely changed. And that shows us that really we've got quite a, a good opportunity there as nutritionists to interact with that process and try to optimize that protein balance. Now, you might think perhaps all of you sitting there not interested in gaining muscle mass necessarily. You're not, you know, most of the guys that I teach at university who are in the gym three to four times a week trying to increase their, their muscle size, etc., etc. However, this sort of stuff is important for everybody. It's not just important for the individual who cares about how they look and wants the perfect beach body. It's, in, it's important for all of us. Okay? One of the, the main health problems that we are suffering at the moment as a population is something called sarcopenia. And this is the age-related loss in muscle mass. As we age, once we get over about 50 to 60 years old, our muscle mass declines. And we become more and more frail. If we've got less muscle, we're less able to do our daily tasks. We're also a lot less able to perhaps recover from things like trips and falls that in a lot of cases um, you know, signify the end of a lot of people's lives. If somebody falls, they break a hip, they might not recover fully from that in uh, injury. So maintaining muscle mass, particularly as we age, and therefore doing things like resistance exercise, being active, and also looking at some nutritional strategies is actually a lot more relevant for our large aging population, not just our young athletes. But most of what I'm talking about today will be for athletes. Um, now, what you can see in this bottom graph is uh, uh, a representation of if somebody did a bout of resistance exercise. So let's say you went to the gym first thing in the morning before you had your breakfast. You can see that the, the protein synthesis responses now, so the black uh, dotted line is a lot bigger. So that increases and it attenuates over the course of the day and by maybe 24 to 48 hours it's back down to the level that it was at. But you can see we stress the muscle. As long as we provide some protein, the muscle can increase its synthesis rate and therefore we can build new protein and hopefully optimize uh, body composition and muscle mass going forwards. And that's kind of the principle of resistance exercise training. OK, so where does milk fit into that? Um, so this was a study done nearly 10 years ago now. And, and what they did here was they had a group of, of, of males, young males, do a bout of resistance exercise. And what they, what they did is, um, using some isotope, uh, stable isotope methods, uh, and taking samples of people's muscle, which isn't necessarily a pleasant experience because you have to have a hole put in your muscle. A biopsy needle goes in, you then take a bit of the, uh, the muscle out. And from the incorporation of some of those stable isotope tracers, we can see how much muscle has actually been built in response to that bout of resistance exercise. If you, um, if you talk to most sports nutritionists that do research, if you ask them to look at their legs, you'll probably see little scars and holes in their legs along their uh, vastus lateralis muscle that goes along here in their quadriceps where they've undertaken experiments or been part of experiments that have looked at muscle metabolism, these sort of experiments. So we all have little, little dots in our legs. Um, sometimes it's almost a competition between who can, who can have the most. Um, so you'll see, initially, during exercise, no real difference in the rate of muscle protein synthesis. However, straight after that bout of exercise, these subjects were given either uh, 500 mils of skimmed milk or on the second occasion in the white bar, the same amount of protein and the same amount of energy from a soy protein containing drink. And what they showed in this study was that there's an increase in protein synthesis post-exercise, as I showed in the previous graph, but that that's really optimized with milk protein. So when the milk was consumed, we saw a, a, an increased rate of muscle protein synthesis. So this is important because it kind of gives us an idea of what people should look to consume after exercise 
if they're looking to maximize their anabolic response and maximize the amount of muscle that they build, whether that's an old person or whether that's a young person. So the, the next studies that were done kind of answered that question. So this is a, this is a training study. So this isn't, they haven't just done one bout of resistance exercise. In this, they've done a progressive resistance training program over 12 weeks. So they trained these subjects for 12 weeks, had groups of around 20, and they trained five days a week, so 60 training sessions. Now, in one group, they gave them a carbohydrate drink. In the other group, they gave them a soy-containing drink. And in the third group, they gave them skimmed milk again. So three different drinks. Now, all the drinks had the same amount of energy, so we're not looking at energy delivery here. The soy and the milk had the same amount of protein. So we can attribute it to the specific effects of milk or soy or, or the carbohydrate. And if you look at the, the bars on the left-hand side, that's body mass. So when they measured body mass, there was no discernible difference between the three different drinks. However, when they separated that change in body mass down to changes in either fat-free mass, so our muscle mass, or fat mass, our adipose tissue, we saw some differences develop. So the middle bar here is the change in body fat. And you can see that it decreased in all three conditions. However, it decreased the most in the milk. And it decreased more in the milk trial than it did in the soy or the carbohydrate trial. So consuming milk after resistance exercise increases the amount of fat that's lost during that resistance training program. Conversely, when we look at uh, muscle mass, so fat and bone-free mass is everything else that's left, which is your muscles, um, we can see again greater increases with the milk than with the soy and the carbohydrate. So again, consuming milk after exercise really maximizes the amount of muscle that can be built with that training program. All of these people did the same training. So really, really interesting there. And that's important for all of us. So these were all male subjects. So if you're a male and you embark on an, uh, a resistance training program, if you consume milk, so around a pint of milk is perfect, um, 20 grams of protein is what we need to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis after exercise, and conveniently, that's contained in exactly a pint of milk, um, so it works out quite nicely. So you can pay about 50p for your uh, post-exercise recovery drink. Um, you'll maximize the amount of muscle that you build, and you'll maximize the amount of fat that you lose. So really, really interesting there. Alongside this, the, uh, the same research group, which is a research group over in Canada, did the same study, but with females. Now, in my experience, a lot of females are a bit hesitant to take up resistance exercise because they think they'll end up you know, growing really big muscles and becoming very muscly. This was the same sort of program here, so 12 weeks of resistance exercise, five times a week. Now, for the ladies, the news was probably even better, I think. So over the 12 weeks, we can see around just under two kilos of muscle were gained. This is good. An increase in muscle is actually good. As I said, helps support your body weight, helps um, in sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, but also as well, muscle acts as uh, the main site of glucose disposal in the body. So with things like type 2 diabetes being major health concerns at the moment, having greater muscle mass will allow a greater place, a greater site for that glucose to actually be disposed of and might help with glycemic control as well. Um, but what the women displayed, more so than the men, was a very, very large reduction in body fat. So the women's body fat loss was even better than the men's. So much so that in the milk trial, the women didn't really gain any weight. So on the scales, they stayed the same. However, the tissue had been redistributed so that there was more muscle and less fat which is kind of the holy grail for fitness training. You ask somebody embarking on a fitness program what they want to achieve, and the two things they'll tell you probably is, you know, either get more toned or increase muscle mass and decrease body fat. Those are the two things that people want to do. And by combining resistance exercise training and milk ingestion post-exercise, you seem to achieve this in both males and females. Okay, so... 
another component that's important for resistance exercise and recovery from resistance exercise is muscle damage. So if you do a, a bout of resistance exercise, you might find in the couple of days after that, you feel quite sore. Now, this data that I'm going to show you here actually came from a, a BBC One show that we were asked to um, contribute towards. And this was looking at milk versus sports drink in a group of rugby players. So we put them through a, a bout of muscle damaging exercise. So in this case, it was squat jumps. So they had to squat down and then jump up as high as they could and then go straight into another jump. And they did 10 of those and they did the 10 reps 10 times. So they ended up doing 100 jumps. So by the next day, they were pretty sore. Um, Immediately after exercise and uh, an hour after exercise, we gave them either uh, 500 mils of milk or 500 mils of an isotonic sports drink. And what we showed with this, it was quite, quite um, striking really. This is the data from how sore people felt their muscles were. And you can see between before the training session to 24 hours afterwards, there's an increase in soreness. This is called delayed onset muscle soreness, or DOMS. Any of you who've done any unfamiliar exercise might be familiar with this sensation. Um, but over the next 24 hours, we can see that that increase no longer happened in the milk trial. However, it continued to happen in the sports drink trial. So those that had the sports drink got sore and sore over the 48 hours, whereas those that had the milk didn't. Now, this is important because actually... Maintaining exercise training during either athletic training programs or training for health is really, really important. And if you're rating your muscle soreness as about 95% of what you could perceive the maximum soreness of muscles to be, you're probably not going to exercise that day. However, in the milk group, they weren't that sore and they might have been able to do more exercise which might be beneficial from an energy balance point of view, a training adaptation point of view. There's lots of important implications there. Um, and just really kind of backing that up, there was a, a, a study that's published in the scientific literature here where they did very similar measures to what we did in that demonstration, but they also measured muscle function. And you can see there were two different milk drinks. So these two at the top here um, represent two milk drinks. Um, and the bottom two are a sports drink and water. And when you look at performance of uh, the specific muscle group that was damaged, you can see that it reduces slightly over the time, but that reduction is a lot less when the milk-containing drinks were actually consumed. So again, attenuation of muscle damage there. And I guess if we're looking at summarizing those results, so after resistance exercise, there's three main um, three main areas that we can summarize those as. So milk intake actually increases acute muscle protein synthesis, so increases the building capacity of the muscle. Um, it enhances gains of muscle mass during training and also reduces um, muscle damage as well. Okay, endurance exercise. So the first one I really want to talk about is rehydration after exercise. So this is a study that demonstrates the, the benefits of milk from a rehydration point of view. And you can see the top two lines there are sports drinks and water. The bottom two lines are milk-containing drinks. So in this study, the subjects were dehydrated. They then drank one of the four drinks, and then they measured the amount of urine that was produced after that um, drink being consumed. It was around two litres of drink. And you can see in the bottom two drinks, virtually no urine produced. So milk massively enhanced the rehydration post-exercise. Uh, we then went on to do another study um, where we specifically targeted the milk protein. And you can see from this, this graph that the one on the right-hand side was when the subjects rehydrated with a, a milk protein-containing drink. On the right-hand side, it's a carbohydrate-only drink. So again, a typical sports drink. And uh, a bigger number here means better rehydration. So it's the amount of drink that's actually retained. And you can see that we achieved better rehydration with the milk protein containing drink. So pretty important there. Um, again, we replicated these findings in a TV um, show. So this was on um, Channel 4's food hospital um, with some teenagers that were doing some football. And again, we showed better rehydration with milk than with a sports drink. Sorry, it was water in that case. 
Um, so moving on to muscle glycogen resynthesis, we can see here, this isn't a milk drink, but the only, the only real studies that have been done have been on, done on chocolate milk and then a, a carbohydrate-containing drink that has the same number of calories as chocolate milk. And you can see that both the carbohydrate drink and the chocolate milk performed equally in terms of muscle glycogen resynthesis. So just as good muscle glycogen resynthesis from the, the chocolate milk as the carbohydrate drink. And although the muscle glycogen resynthesis was the same, they actually showed that performance was actually recovered better when somebody had the chocolate milk drink compared to the carbohydrate-only drink. So again, enhanced recovery here of this time endurance performance. Um, when this is put into a chronic training situation, so looking at endurance training, um, we can see that gains in fitness and aerobic fitness are enhanced when somebody consumes a milk-containing drink after exercise compared to a standard sports drink. So the, the graph on, this, on the left-hand side, the bar on the left-hand side is chocolate milk after exercise, the bar in the middle is carbohydrate, and the bar on the right is placebo. So again, optimized recovery with endurance training. And we can just summarize that with um, the three take-home points for endurance exercise. So milk enhances post-exercise rehydration, also enhances muscle glycogen resynthesis after exercise, and therefore performance, and also increases adaptation to endurance training, which is one of the main, um, you know, the main reasons for doing endurance training is to become fitter and optimize health. So finally, um, just to kind of finish here with weight management, just got a couple of slides. Um, so this is a study that we did recently where we looked at how consuming milk influences appetite after exercise. So as I said earlier, if we're looking at somebody who wants to lose weight, we might actually argue that consuming something after exercise is a negative thing because it adds calories to the body. And that means that that person doesn't achieve the same negative energy balance that they would have if they hadn't have consumed that, that item. And this applies to milk, it applies to sports drink, it applies to, to any of the sort of sports foods that you might have around training. Um, so what we did was a study where we, we took a group of people that were exercising for health. So these aren't athletes. Um, they're, they're people that were exercising to optimize health. And we put them through a one-hour period of exercise. Um, after that exercise, we gave them either uh, 600 mils of skimmed milk, 600 mils of a carbohydrate drink that had the same amount of energy, or 600 mils of water, where it was a, it was a placebo control in this condition because they were, they were blinded to the treatments. Now, the graph on the left-hand side shows you how much food they ate in the post-exercise period after having that drink. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't um, include the calories that are contained in the drink. So what you can see is the placebo drink and the carbohydrate drink trials, they ate the same amount. So the same number of calories. When they had milk, that suppressed the amount of calories that they consumed. So they ate less. Now, if we add in the calories that were contained in the drink, so the milk and the carbohydrate drink contained calories, that gives us the graph on the right-hand side. And this shows you that if you consume milk after exercise from a, an energy intake standpoint, the total energy that you'll consume, including the milk that you've drunk after exercise, will be the same as if you only had water. So that's a really important message, because as I've shown you, milk can optimize recovery, and if we're looking at having a negative energy balance, it can also not produce that increased energy intake. However, if you have the carbohydrate drink, the sports drink, there's a significant increase in energy intake, which in the long run, might mean that you don't achieve that weight loss that you're trying to achieve, or you achieve less weight loss. Okay, so to, so to summarize perhaps my presentation, probably put it into two main points. So I think we can say that from the balance of the literature and the studies that have been done that are out there, milk ingestion post-exercise can enhance the acute recovery to a bout of either resistance exercise or endurance exercise. And it can also um, optimize chronic training adaptations um, 
to that, those same exercise stimuli. Um, we can also say from a weight management point of view, which is probably even more important than our, our athletes, that milk post-exercise might actually facilitate better weight management than if you were to consume a standard sports drink, whilst also providing some of the adaptations that might be beneficial for the exercise training, but also beneficial for health. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.